All right. I am pleased to welcome our next speaker, who was actually our former speaker, but is now our next speaker, Dr. David Horn. Dr. Horn is an adjunct associate professor in global health, an associate professor of medicine in pulmonary critical care, critical care and sleep medicine at the University of Washington. And he's also medical director of the Furland Northwest TB Center. Dr. Horn, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I am here to talk to you about IGRIS. Uh, so I can answer hopefully all of your questions about IGRIS. I won't necessarily be able to answer all of your questions about the civil surgeon process. So I will turn that over to people who are better able to answer it. And hopefully together we can get all your questions answered. Um, this is, I, I think there's probably going to be various levels of familiarity and interest in different aspects of this. So please feel free to um, raise your hand and interrupt me to ask questions or to uh, get clarification on things during this talk. Um, and we don't have to get through the entire entirety of it because there's stuff that goes beyond IGRIS, so don't worry about slowing me down. <coughs> I have no disclosures to report. Here's the background. Test for LTBI. Um, a little bit about TB diagnosis. I know that's not going to be uh, under your purview, but you may be awaiting the results or other things. And then LTBI treatment. Is anyone here uh, planning on perhaps treating some of uh, these pay these individuals with LTBI? Okay, so, so all right, so there is some relevance to it. Um, uh, just a little primer. Um, one of the hallmarks of TB is variability. Variability in who becomes infected. So only about 30, 40% of close contacts be become infected, and variability in who goes on to develop TB after latent TB infection, right? The, the, the usual statistics that is quoted is about 10% lifetime risk of developing TB. So most people that have LTBI will be ignorant of that fact, will die from something else, it will never bother them. But there are 10% of people who will likely go on, progress to TB. And so why do we try to identify them? Because we can intervene on that. As you see here, 80% of US cases are due to reactivation. The other way you can get TB is to rapidly progress shortly after your exposure. And so that's perhaps less preventable. But if we could identify all these people that were going to, the 80% that were going on to develop TB, we could present with our T, uh, LTBI treatment, we could present prevent 80% of the cases in the United States. Um, as you can see here, uh, this is an error. I don't remember if it's 2.9 or 2.8, but that probably doesn't matter. Here's a map. The, the uh, prevalence of latent TB infection varies dramatically in the world. In the, uh, um, and this is TB. So the incidence of TB in the United States uh, most recently is about 2.8 to 2.9 per 100,000, whereas in places like uh, Western Cape of Southern Africa, the rates are as high as 1,000 per 100,000. So marked differences in the world. You'll be seeing many patients who come from these areas of high prevalence um, globally, who are at high risk for latent TB infection and may even be at risk for active TB. How are we doing in the United States? This is sort of active cases of TB over the, since 1982. As you can see, since 1992, the, that peak in the early 90s was related to both HIV as well as decreases in the funding of TB control um, in the uh, sort of public health system of the United States. We've had steady declines. We're now under 10,000 cases per year in the United States, all-time record lows. But our ability to control TB varies by population. While the overall numbers of cases have dropped, as a percent, the non-U.S. born forms a much higher percent. Back in 1993, non-U.S. born were only 30% of the cases of TB in the United States. Now in 2014, in fact, more recently, it's almost 80% of cases. So TB in the United States has largely become an, a, a, a disease among the non-US born. And in Washington state, it's even higher. It's about 85% of all cases in Washington state are among the non-US born. So that's why you're playing a vital role in this process of diagnosing early and perhaps having the opportunity for someone to treat them and prevent progression to TB. This is uh, this was came out in 2017. I know it says 
diagnosis of tuberculosis, but they also cover diagnosis of latent TB infection. If you need a resource, this is the joint guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control, American Thoracic Society, Infectious Disease Society of America. So this is a good place to go. Just Google it. It's publicly available. You can download it. So why am I here? To talk about the test for latent TB infection. Historically, we use the tuberculin skin test available for over 100 years. More recently, we've had something access to something called interferon gamma release assays. Depending on the day of the week, I'll either say IGRAs or IGRAs, so you guys can. Um, and those, the first commercially available one in the United States was FDA approved in 2001. So we've had these around for less than 20 years. Despite the sort of difference of, you know, plus minus 100 years in development of these assays, both the skin test and the IGRAs, so there's two commercially available IGRAs, the Quantiferon test. We're now in the fourth generation of that, which is the Quantiferon Gold Plus. And the T-spot TB test, as well as the tuberculin skin test, are all kind of based on the same principle. What they're saying is they're exposing a person's immune cells, either in vivo or in vitro, to antigens that are shared with tuberculosis and seeing whether or not there's evidence that this person's immune cells have previously seen these antigens and are going to wake up and elicit a response. And that response is either measured in the induration, the swelling, the tuberculin skin test, or it's measured in the production of interferon gamma. So same principle for both. Key difference, tuberculin skin test uses purified protein derivative which is a gamish of, you know, 200 plus different antigens. So it's just ground up TB. Whereas these tests, the, uh, the quantiferon and the T-spot, use far fewer number of antigens, just two or three. And actually the newest generation of quantiferon just uses two antigens. So what that, what that allows is it achieves a greater specificity because you're, you're leaving out these other 200 antigens that are shared with things like BCG, and with things like non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, so as I said, this has a lot of different antigens, so it's relatively non-specific. This would be the total pool of antigens, and this little blue stripe here is the ones that are detected by your quantiferon and your T-spot. Now, it's, it's not shared with most non-tuberculous mycobacteria. There's a few with whom it's shared, so if someone had Kansasii infection, and you did a, a quantiferon on them, it would likely be positive. That would be a false positive. But that's a detail, and I've been warned not to get lost in the weeds. Okay. So why do we sort of, in certain situations, counsel against use of the tuberculin skin test? Well, its specificity is poor to good. When is it good? In someone who is U.S. born and has never had BCG vaccination. When is it bad? In someone who's not U.S. born and has had BCG vaccination. In addition, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, things like MAC, um, which are actually quite common in the Pacific Northwest, can also cross-react with the tuberculin skin test and give you a false positive. So really, that's one of the big advantages of IGRAs, this greater specificity, particularly in non-U.S. born populations. You don't have issues with boosting, which you can have with a tuberculin skin test. Um, there's different manufacturers of the tuberculin formula, and it has to be refrigerated. So you may have questionable quality of the, of the tuberculin that you're placing on someone's arm. It also requires techniques. You need to do it, you know, you need to do the injection not too deep, and you need to be able to measure it. And that's not an easy task. And then you only need one encounter with the healthcare system, right? You draw the blood and they don't have to come back for any read because that blood is going to be processed in the laboratory. Whereas for a tuberculin skin test, you place it and 48 to 72 hours later, they need to come back for a read, interpretation of the, of the amount of induration. Um, this, is, this is data from the NHANES, the U.S. survey about the state of our health. And the only reason I put this up is to show, to, to focus here. So, um, so a common, so let's just say that we'll use the 10 millimeters of induration as a positive tuberculin skin test there. What you can see is depending on the population, 
there is imperfect agreement between the skin test and the IGRAs. So here is the IGRAs and the skin test in this non-US born population are agreeing. But some of the time they don't agree. Some of the time you're gonna have a positive skin test and a negative IGRA. Well, maybe that's BCG vaccination. Some of the time you're gonna have a positive IGRA and a negative skin test. And some of the time you're gonna have agreement about both being negative. Now, I say that IGRAs are definitely more specific and better tests in non-US born individuals who have likely had BCG vaccination. When we look at US born, we can see, first of all, there's a far lower, lesser amount of, of LTBI prevalence. About, it's less than 3% in, 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 not, in US born individuals. But what we can see this here is unlike non-US born, actually the quantiferon positive TST negative is fairly common. And we don't understand that. We, we don't know what that means. And that's why um, we don't have a strong recommendation about using the IGRAs in US born. And also the you, way you interpret the, the tests is based on your pretest probability. And, and this is not gonna apply so much to the, um, the process of someone changing their status, but may apply to your uh, other patients that you'll see. And just remember, here's test accuracy. So sensitivity is the probability of a positive test in someone with infection. Specificity is the probability of a negative test in someone without infection. So if your test has 50% sensitivity, 50% of the time you apply that test to someone who has the disease, it will be positive. So it'll be wrong 50% of the time. 50% specificity, 50% of the time you apply that test to someone without disease, it will be positive, a false positive. So those would not be good tests. And we use, in general, we use targeted testing because these are imperfect tests. So if you applied this test, if we just tested everywhere in the, everyone in the United States, about half the time we got a positive result, it would be a false positive. And that's why we, we say, does this person have risk factors? Someone who's changing their status, that's non-US born, who's not from Sweden, who's from Sub-Saharan Africa or from Latin America, Southeast Asia, has risk factors. How is the test performed? Um, blood is collected um, either into a single tube, heparinized, or into the multiple tubes. This is for quantiferon. It's taken, this, uh, taken the lab. It can sit um, at room temperature for about 16 hours, up to 16 hours, but then has to be, or actually, I think it's 16 hours. Then it has to be incubated for 16 hours, um, uh, or has to be intubated, or incubated for 16 to 24 hours, and then this plasma is collected. And so for the quantiferon, you get a, a number, international units per ml. For the T-spot TB, you get spot counts. But they, they are, they're, they're roughly equivalent tests. So one is not necessarily better than the other. I have, and most people have, more experience with quantiferon because it was FDA approved much earlier. Um, but they are roughly equivalent tests. They're not perfect, and there's plenty of sources of error, including when the blood is drawn, if the tube is not agitated, if it's not you know, kept at room temperature or incubated in adequate amounts of time. There can be errors with the lab. So again, this is a great test, but it's not perfect. Do people, are people familiar with IGRAs, quantiferons? Everyone's used them before. Has anyone not used them before? Does, every, does anyone use the T-spot, or do most people use quantiferon? T-spot, let's see T-spot hands, okay. Does everyone else then use quantiferon? Um, and so the quantiferon that was the golden tube was the third generation, generation. That's being phased out for this quantiferon plus. And the main difference is instead of having three, two, remember, you can draw it into just one heparinized tube and let the lab take care of it. But if you draw it into the tubes from the manufacturer, there's four tubes instead of three. And they added a tube that's supposed to query um, uh, CD8 cells in addition to CD4 cells. But, you know, again, that's, that's the main difference. They're, they're roughly, the fourth generation is roughly similar to the third generation. You'll get numbers back, right? Um, and so... For quantiferon, you get numbers that look like this. Well, first of all, you get this, positive. 
Um, and you're not going to be left to interpret this, but just briefly so you know what these numbers mean. The, the new quantifiron plus just has a fourth tube, another antigen tube. But basically, there's a tube that assesses the nil, just the background level of interferon gamma expression, so that you can adjust for that. There's a tube that has a mitogen, just to that anyone who has a healthy immune system, their, their cells should get excited and produce a lot of interferon gamma. And this is just assessing the health of someone's immune system. And then there's an antigen tube that contains these two or three TB antigens that these cells are exposed to. And so if there's too much background noise in this nil tube, then you can't really interpret the results and you get an indeterminate. If there's too little of a response to the mitogen, that the white cells aren't responding as we would like, you can't interpret the result and you get an indeterminate. Those, those situations aside, when you, you look at the TB antigen result, and then they subtract the background. So 2.18 minus 0.86 equals 1.32. 1.32 is greater than 0.35. That's the cutoff. If it's less than 0.35, we say it's a negative test. If it's greater than 0.35, like in this person, we say it's a positive test. Someone has a value of 0.36, you know, you, you have to, you know, with your other patients, you use your judgment. But if it's someone who's U.S. born, I would, I would call that a negative test, despite the fact that it would say positive there, because there's noise in the system. But this is fairly positive, and you can get values as high as greater than 10. Situation for the T spot is the same. Instead of having this international units and having to deal with decimal points, you just have spots. Again, you're going to have, the, it's going to subtract the antigen from the background minus the nil, and you'll get a spot difference. So here, greater than or equal to eight spots is positive. Less than or equal to four spots is negative. There's an indeterminate like quantiferon, meaning that either there was too much background noise or there wasn't enough of a response to a stimulus that should give a good response. But with T-spot, there's this weird borderline category, and it doesn't exist in Europe. In Europe, they only have positive, negative, indeterminate with a cutoff of six spots. This borderline category means, um, well, it would be akin to a having different cutoffs for your, your skin test in duration. It sort of means it's neither strongly positive nor negative, and perhaps one should use your, your pretest probability and your judgment in sort of assigning a positive or negative to this. It's not indeterminate. You, you have a valid response. It's just that it's not strongly in one category or the other. Really, when you're, for, I know for indeterminates, and I believe for borderlines, if you get those results in your patients who is changing his status, that patient does not need a chest X-ray. Is that correct for borderlines as well? Do you know? Or, so borderlines, they do what with? Because okay, all right, it's determined. And indeterminates, you don't have to do anything more. You can treat them like negatives. No chest X-ray, and you're done with the processing them. Okay, so. The only ones that have need further workup are the ones with positive, patients with positive. So again, this just sort of goes over saying, you know, what an indeterminate means and what a borderline means. But bottom line, if you get either of those results, you can treat them like a negative, no chest X-ray, and you're done with the patient. What about age under five? Um, tests, and uh, what are the recommendations that you're using for this process for age under five? Okay. So that actually, um, so here, this is that guideline I showed you. They sort of say in that less than five years of age is preferred to use a skin test. So just, just know that there's gonna be a difference. If you look at this and what you're looking at your instructions, and in fact, your instructions, are totally in, in line with the, um, with the Red Book, with the Pediatric Association. They've shown that basically, uh, actually more recent data suggests that in immunocompetent children, an IGRA is fine in, in kids down to two years of age. 
And many experts would go down to one year of age. So you're, you're okay. You're okay following the instructions that you have. So here's just another thing. I heard some discussion about if someone's been treated before for LTBI, you expect the IGRA to remain positive. And, and that's probably true. Your IGRA levels can change for all sorts of reasons that we poorly understand. And this just shows that patients undergoing treatment for LTBI or active TB, their IGRA levels can go up, down, or stay flat. Bottom line, we do not use IGRAs nor the skin test to a sense a, a response to treatment. We, we don't for active TB or for latent TB infection. You can't use it for that purpose, okay? So treating someone and then testing an IGRA afterwards doesn't make any sense. Um, just a very brief amount about a TB diagnosis. So just some examples of chest x-rays that are suggestive of TB because you get a chest x-ray if someone has a positive IGRA. Um, so typically, if someone is not immunosuppressed, regardless of this is reactivation or primary progressive TB, you typically expect to see at a minimum changes in the upper lobes. If someone's immunocompromised, then all bets are off, and you can have an atypical chest X-ray. So like in this woman, we can see up here some upper lobe infiltrator consolidation, suggestive of, you know, some uh, fibrocalcific changes that would be consistent. You don't know if that's old TB or active TB. They may have had TB. Patients do about 25% of patients will develop TB, heal on their own, never take any medications, not be aware that they had TB. They are at very high risk for reactivation down the road, but you get a chest X-ray like this and they say, no, I never had TB. Well, they may have had TB that they healed on their own. And those patients should be targeted Highly targeted for LTBI treatment. Here's another one. We see upper lobe disease, like a cavity there. Last one I can't determine, like active versus, you know, healed on its own. This looks active to me. This looks very active to me, right? The disease would have started up in one of the upper lobes, but it subsequently spread. And it spread throughout the lower lobes as well. Endobronchial spread. And here's another patient. We see that maybe in the soup segment of the left lower lobe here, it looks like there's an air fluid level. So cavity probably filled with something. <laughs> and they've had some additional spread down here, some nodular changes. These are all chest x-rays that would be highly concerning, that would, at a minimum, you'd collect sputum on them. And some of these patients, this one, they'd be put in isolation. You collect sputum. You can either start treatment now or wait to see your sputum results. But Okay, so TB diagnosis, how will the health department try and diagnose TB? They'll collect sputum. Um, and, and if the patient can cough it up, great. If they can't, then you'll induce it with hypertonic saline. Induced sputum is just as good as a bronchoscopy. So look for AFB smears. But 50% of pulmonary TB in the United States is smear negative because you need a certain amount of bugs in their bacilli to be able to have a smear that's positive. Negative smear does not rule out TB. Our best test is culture. We have a pretty good intermediate test, which is PCR, which looks for little pieces of TB DNA. So gene expert is one type. There's a whole bunch of both commercial and in-house systems. Sensitivity is better than this and not as good as this. Sensitivity in smear positive disease is great. Smear negative disease, let's say it's gonna pick it up about half the time. So intermediate between the two but you get your results fast. If someone sticks in a gene expert machine, they have the results back within two hours. Culture, not so fast, right? Culture, depending on whether it's solid, we always used to say up to eight weeks. These liquid systems are both more sensitive and faster, but still, it's gonna take them four to six weeks to finalize it as negative. So if you send that patient off to the health department, you might not hear back from them if they're gonna be referred back for at least six weeks. Okay, until it's negative, because there's no rush to treat latent TB infection. You want to make sure that someone doesn't have active disease, because you don't want to treat latent infection with just one or two drugs for a short, inadequate course. So there was a few hands about LTBI treatment. Um, so when you're thinking about treating someone, so let's say they've been sent off the health department, 
because of their abnormal chest X-ray, sputum collected, maybe that first X-ray that suggested possibly old disease. Their sputums are negative, they're back to you, and you'd like to treat them. Well, you have to rule out active disease, which has been done. You want to make sure that they don't have a history of previous LTBI treatment, because if they have, there's no point in retreating them. You want to look at risk factors for adverse effects to your, your latent TB treatment. Particularly, the most feared, the most feared side effect is, any, is hepatotoxicity. You want to avoid drug-induced uh, uh, liver injury. So risk factors include pre-existing liver, uh, liver disease, heavy alcohol use, recent pregnancy, recent delivery. And if you're going to treat someone with an INH-containing regimen and they're at risk for neuropathy, including diabetes, kidney disease, alcoholism, low BMI, HIV, pregnancy, seizure disorders, um, then you will want to also supplement them with B6. The treatments, um, so this, this was our workhorse, right? INH daily for nine months. We have some newer regimens, rifampin daily for four months, or INH and rifapentine once a week for, uh, for, for 12 weeks. This is just to show you the longer the treatment, the less likely someone is going to complete it. So I would say, and most, I think, TB experts would say, that isoniazid for nine months is your third choice of your options. Rifampin, two articles recently came out in New England Journal of Medicine showing that rifampin was at least as good as INH and you had better completion rates. So it would be four months, 600 milligrams would be the top dose per day for four months. Non-inferior to INH, higher rate of treatment completion. There are some side effects, but lesser than nine months of INH. The main issue with rifampin and rifapentine is they can induce your cytochrome P450 system, so they can decrease the level of certain other medications a patient may be taking. So medications to keep in mind include oral contraceptives. If they're going to take rifampin with an oral contraceptive, they need to use a barrier method while they're on it. Uh, methadone, uh, warfarin, and many of the DOEX, um, anti-epileptic drugs, uh, some of your blood pressure meds. So that can complicate things, and you have to just keep that in mind. INH rifapentine, that was uh, about three years ago was when the New England Journal paper came out. It's a, a great regimen. It's once a week. Originally, it was stud studied as DOT, but subsequent publications have shown that you can give it as self-administered therapy. Um, like rifampin, rifapentine may alter your level of other drugs. Remember, it's got INH, so consider giving B6 or pyridoxine with each dose. So 12 doses of pyridoxine. Um, and then finally, INH, which is our third choice. But if someone is on another drug and you don't want to worry about, like, oh, the Coumadin is going to be hard, too hard to manage, well, INH may be a good choice. But remember, I, I mean, both of these drugs, both rifampin regimen and rifapentine INH, have much, much lower rates, you know, 90% lower chance of developing drug-induced um, uh, liver injury with these regimens. And so they may spur you to treat patients that are, like, older, you know, in their 50s, for instance. Um, and then remember, regardless of the regimen, you're supposed to see the patient, a face-to-face -face encounter, once a month to assess for, for uh, side effects. You don't need baseline monitoring unless there, there is um, risk for liver injury. So your healthy patient who's coming in, you don't need to get any labs. Once they've ruled out active TB, you can go ahead and treat them. Um, remember, I said monthly evaluation for adverse effects. You can ask about nausea, vomiting, if their eyes are yellow. But also ask them about things like fatigue, because that could be a clue that their ALT is 1,200. And that is it for the talk. Um, so there's lots of resources available to people here. Your local health department, your state health department, the Curry Center and International TB Center at UCSF has a warm line. 
And then on a weekly basis, every Monday from 1230 to 130, we have Washington State TV Echo, which is a multi-point video conferencing system. Myself and Scott Linquist, Masa Narita, Chris Spitters, Lana, Monica, various other people are there. We have didactics every other week, but we always have cases that we discuss, both active TB and latent TB. You're free to bring your case to discuss it with us, or you're free to just like sit in and listen as well. And we can set you up. You just go up there um, and we can get you enrolled. So I think I finished early. So questions, sure. Yeah. No, not no, 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 not necessarily. No, no. So indeterminate can either be due to this high background noise, right? There's just a lot of interfering gamma. I think you're referencing referencing the situation in which there's a poor response to this mitogen, that their immune cells seem to be weak. And certainly any type of immunocompromised, liver disease, things like that can cause it. But I would say that you're, if you tested all those people for HIV, you'd get a ton of negative tests. It, it really has poor predictive value for that. If with your other patients, because once you're done, you've got the indeterminate, you're done. One study that I flashed through showed that about 70% of patients that had an indeterminate, if you retested them with the same test, and that indeterminate may be just due to poor processing. If you retest them with the same test, 70% on retesting will either come up with a positive or a negative. Not for this process. Sure. The recommendations are either you can retest with that test or you can use a different test skin test or the other IGRA that you haven't used. Sure. So the technical instructions do specify too that when you get an indeterminate to let the applicant know this isn't a negative result. They don't have to go on a chest x-ray, but there's actually a spot on the I-693 to put indeterminate, not, you know, negative or, or positive, and to let them know that, you know, we recommend they be tested again, but not part of this process. Sure. Patient coming, for example, um, uh, he is positive for um, uh, latent TB for the quantiferin, and then he want to retest it, and results is negative. So how do you proceed? <clears throat> There's noise in the test in that situation. You know, I that's when that's when I would urge looking at the actual number, not just a positive and negative. Let's say his first test was like a 0.45. Remember, the cutoff is a 0.35. That's a weekly positive test. And I would say that most of those patients, well, if it was U.S. born, almost all those patients would be actually false positive. It's hard to know with non-U.S. born, but if a patient was U.S. born and you retested them, probably just the noise in the test, they'd come back negative, and that would be the truth. With someone who is non-U.S. born, um, that's why we, we, we urge targeted testing. If, if someone is non-U.S. born, if they're from sub-Saharan Africa, they're from Kenya, and I am worried about latent TB infection in them, and I get a positive test, but it's like a 0.5, I think they have enough risk factors for latent TB infection where I'm going to trust that result. You need to bring in your, your sort of pretest probability, your clinical judgment into it. So with this patient... I mean, it sounds like they don't want to take LTBI treatment. So I don't know where truth is. It would, might be helpful if I could see the different numbers. If the first IGRA response was like six and the second was negative, I don't know what's going on there. Um, you know, that's what, but isn't that what we do? We keep testing until we get the answer we want. So, our, our, okay, yes. Well, it's the same, it's the same, it's the yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, it means the, the manufacturer suggests that it's, it gives you some information because um, it gives you an information either there's a lot of background noise or they didn't have a great response and you could look at that. You could also try switching to, to performing TST is fine or you could switch to the other IGRA. Those are all, those are all options. Remember these tests have, you know, they've been around for 17 years we've been using them clinically, which is not a huge amount of time. There's no gold standard for latent TB infection. We cannot, there's no gold standard. Our standard is someone has one of these positive tests and we know that these tests are only about, depends on what you look at, 70 to 90% sensitive. So there's, so that's, that's the issue. That's why it's hard to come up with a straight answer. And most of these tests, they were tested in patients that had active TB, right? Because it should be act, it, positive in that. So, you know, that's sort of where there's like this, you know, where I'm not giving you a, a, a firm answer, it's, it's based on all those factors. Yes. I'm going to have to turn the question over. You know, the apical capping used to be, people used to think of that it was suggestive of TB. It's, 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 it's very nonspecific. So in my practice, I would ignore that, but I don't want to give wrong information. <laughs> I'll refer them to me. Okay. So, uh, um, so I, with well, a guy. really rely on, you know, the radiologist and TB experts to decide if it's active TB. I mean, there's some classic things like, single calcified nodule that suggests like old TBI and not active TB. And if the radiologist says that, um, that's fine. If the... I mean, really the triggers would be what I showed you up there, which would be terms like fibrocalcific changes, uh, fibronodular disease, upper lobe, a single calcified granulomata, I would not get excited about. That does imply exposure to some infection in the past, TB or fungal or something else, um, but a lot of patients have that, right? And even if you refer that patient for follow-up of a pulmonary nodule, calcified suggests it's been there a long time and we don't get excited about it. We're not gonna subject them to two years of follow-up. Apical capping, that comes in all the time, particularly with like sort of class B referrals, it's always described there was probably some apical process, but if the parenchyma is clear, then I would not react to that as TB. It's either a normal X-ray or something. Yeah, uh, you could put other condition. I would say. Again, it's, uh, you know, how you make that call. You can't just make a call of latent TB from a, from a chest X-ray alone. So it's a little, but I would say that those, those things and, you know, calcified granuloma, that apical capping, it, it, apical capping, I might even just say like normal TB. I would probably just check normal TB for that. Uh, a granuloma, I would probably check like other findings, not TB. Um, that, that's how I would go. And we'll have um, training later in the year, I think, from a radiologist for a civil surgeon. So if you're not on our sign-up list, please um, get on our sign-up list back here, and we'll have webinars throughout the year. Okay. I think any more questions? Sure. Yeah. So sensitivity patients that have active TB. Okay. It should, be, it should be positive, right? If you're saying that this person's... Now, again, there's cer certain forms. If someone has miliary TB, we know that that makes the skin test and the quinoferon and the T-spot less likely to be positive. But so, and for negative, for the specificity, people from who are like, you know, 
born in Oregon. I mean, basically no risk for TB. That, that's how it's done, right? Um, and so, and then we extrapolate to all these other groups because we don't have like a gold standard for diagnosing latent TB. Um, I think that's time. Great, well, thank you very much.